Hello there, my name is Pastor Buck Wilford. I'm the pastor here at Brunswick Community Church. We're located right in the Rito's Bakery Plaza at 1930 Pearl Road. We have church at 10 a.m. on Sundays and Bible study at 6.30 p.m. on Thursdays. We also have good Christian education hour at 9 a.m. Sundays if you want to come a little early. We're a church that loves people and we love God. We'd love to connect with you. We'd love to uh, meet you. We'd love to just be a part of your life as well, too. We're focused in on preaching the Bible. I do it verse by verse, expository style. We hold to the five solas. We believe strongly that we're saved only by grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone. And it's all to the glory of God alone. And the only thing we hold as infallible and inerrant and strongly adhere to is the scriptures alone. We'd love to see you out here. We'd love to have you come visit. Thank you so much. excited about this weather. I've already mowed the lawn. The mower got stuck like crazy mowing it. But, <laughs> but I did mow it. Got some, things, got some things done. You know, cleaned the yard a little bit. It's so nice. Got some flowers planted. I, you guys, some of you guys got my cane lilies last week. Possibly there's more cane lilies coming. If anybody wants some, because now my neighbor's giving me more. And he told me there's more to be had, maybe to give to the church. And I said, well, we won't let any go to waste. <laughs> but, uh, but it's a good time of year right here, that's for sure. It's a little bit cloudy right now, but I tell you, it's definitely getting better. It's getting better. Things are growing. But uh, with this, for the announcements we have here is this week I've got a Bible study on Jeremiah 27 on Thursday. So Jeremiah 26 was like a court case, and Jeremiah 27 will... Uh, they, they start to do bad things to Jeremiah and stuff in Jeremiah 27. So we'll see how he stands up and what goes on. And then we have the ladies' Bible study on Tuesday at 6. 6 p.m. is the ladies' Bible study right here at the church. And we have, remember, on uh, May 5th, we're going to have potluck, a Mexican potluck. So bring something Mexican. It'll be a delicious day. And then also that day after church, we're going to war game some ideas for outreaches. We're going to try to do like an outreach every three months and something to do. So bring some good ideas for doing stuff to try to reach out to people. It would be good for us and it would be good for people that we talk to. So don't get upset if you think, man, we did this outreach and nobody else came to church. That's all right. I've done a million like that. But it helps us grow as well, too. And sometimes some folks do come, too. So. And it's something that we're commanded to do, and it's something that we can have fun as well, too, while we do it, working together and trying to reach people and everything. So it'll be really good. And now, with all those announcements, I don't think I missed any. I'm going to go ahead and read the passage we're going to preach today. I'm afraid there's only six verses today. I'm going to preach a short sermon on you guys. And I don't know. We'll see. I hope you have some grace for me if it's a shorter sermon. We'll see. All right. But here we'll, we'll, if you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it. If you stand up, it's Luke 14, verses 1 to 6. Not to be confused with John 14, 1 to 6. You know, every time I think 14, 1 to 6, I think John 14, 1 to 6. I can almost repeat all those verses. But this is Luke 14, 1 to 6. It says, And it happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. Behold, in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the scholars of the law and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent, and he took hold of him, healed him, and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well, and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could, not, and they could make no reply to this. So that's it for the scripture passage today. But I tell you, there's a lot of good stuff in those six verses. And may standing if you can. We're going to pray and then we're going to sing some hymns. Father God, I thank you so much for this day, for every single person who's here today, Lord. Lord, help us, Lord, as we come here today to worship you, Lord. As we come here today to learn from your word, to be transformed, to be changed, to grow. As we come here today to encourage each other and to love one another and build each other up, Lord. Help us to do all those things, Lord, as, as we gather together to worship the Lord Jesus as a church, a, a, a church of Jesus Christ, Lord. Thank you so much. And Lord, I ask that you bless us this day and watch over us. Help our eyes to be open. Help our ears to be able to hear. Help us, Lord, to be able to focus and help us, Lord, to 
concentrate and just dedicate this next hour to you, Lord Jesus, to you in the worship of you and help us to lay aside all the cares and the troubles and the anxieties of this world that we all go through as we live life, Lord, and help us to just be at peace and just, and just soak in your word, your truth, and just pour our hearts out to worship you. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Remain seated if you can, or standing if you can. So we're taking yes, the, the black book. This is dangerous. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, the black book, number 58. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Good morning and welcome to Brunswick Community Church. We're glad you're here. And we get to continue through the book of Nehemiah. And before I begin, we were talking about Earth Day and had a question. Earth Day is Monday, right? And as I can Christians do Earth Day. I say just let Genesis 128 be your guide on Earth Day. And, and, and you know, to sum it all up of that verse is we have dominion over all things on the earth, right? That God put us as master and stewards, but we're servants of the most high God. And I just think it's a contradiction that the evolutionists, Darwinism, naturalist people want to celebrate Earth Day. And it's an indication they recognize that there is a creator, but they just take the wrong view of it. So if you come to it, read Genesis 1:28, and if you're in, in that context, it's, it's okay. It's good. Be a good steward of, of the world. But here we're, we're continuing, and we're in Nehemiah 9, 38, 10, 39, and, and we've gotten to this point where they've heard uh, the Torah, the law being read to them, and then they confess their sins, and then they said the prayer, and now they're, after the prayer, they're, they're coming to make a, a covenant, an, an agreement, um, and then uh, the the title of the slide for those who can't see is the commitment to God and we're going to go verses 38 through 39 it sounds like a lot but there's a lot of painstaking Hebrew names <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll get through them and I'll highlight some of the things within the names uh, maybe we'll just pull it up and you can follow along on the names so for time uh, purposes and then I, I just a connecting a verse here when I uh, thought about it uh, the commitment, your work to Yahweh, and your plans will be established. Uh, Proverbs 16, 3. That making goals is is okay. And then when I thought, you can't see on the slide if you're watching, but there's some things we can do to be commitment. You know, we could read our Bible. And I, I thought it was interesting. They're reading the Bible while they're walking. So getting scripture and exercising the body. Baptism, you know, the outward expression of your profession and your possession of faith you know you're making that commitment to everyone and, and to God and an outward appearance and then just a it's a bigger picture there's more people but it, it's shrunk it down it's just a, it was a bible study you know getting together in small groups and studying the word uh, showing your commitment and just uh, we'll open with a prayer dear heavenly father we just thank you again for another beautiful day that creation that you have given and and we recognize your covenants and your promises to us and and we'll use the scripture and see the agreements the people of israel made to be committed to you and then i pray that i just stay fully committed and engage in more prayer more reading and keeping you the center of my life just be with us in this conversation this lesson and guide with words and conversations and our eyes and our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we begin, I got a boring slide, but I thought it was relevant. And I don't know Mr. Tom Mua's personal convictions or, or beliefs, but this is a psychologist. And he was talking about goals in this whole chapter, uh, of, you know, 38 to all the way 39 is about the agreement and covenant and he wrote to be successful studies show people benefit from writing down their goals it's important to set specific objectives that include a timeline detailing exactly what you want to achieve and when you want to achieve it after writing down your action plan it is essential to share it with others publicly committing to pursuing positive outcomes is far more powerful than simply dreaming about it and doing something Writing down goals along with specific steps to success and a list of supportive relationships make it easier to see a positive outcome is possible. An action plan ignites passion, fosters teamwork, and generates optimism, three essential ingredients needed to overcome the obstacles that you face on your path to success. And it kind of ties in because here the, the returnees, they've heard the law, they've recognize their sin and they're coming to make an agreement to God and, and this article right here part of this thing was from uh, make a public commitment to your goals and work toward them every day 
good words to, to use, you know, make goals, write them down, and work towards them. You know, reading plans, Bible scripture. If you write it down and make it, and you share it, and you make it public, you're more apt to do it. You're more accountable to do them. And, uh, and these are uh, certain principles concerning commitments that even the secular society recognize to be true, that if you write down things, you're more likely to continue to do them. And if you tell others about your commitment, right? The baptismal we saw, you're telling everybody, hey, look at the decision I did, and I will trust my life in, in God's hands. And then with this passage, there's two sections here. Uh, you know, chapter 98 through 29 contains uh, the record of the people participating. It's a long list of names, and we'll, we'll get through that. And they made that commitment to God in the second section describes the specifications of the agreement. And if I may, the main summary of the passage that the people have listened to the word of God and confessed their, confessed their sins is one. Two, uh, we'll see that the people are committed to separating themselves from the nations and devoting themselves to the Lord. And then three, they obey God's law in their families, their commerce, and in their worship. Nehemiah 38. 938. Now, because of all this, we are cutting an agreement and writing, and on the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. Now, if you look at the now, because of all this, they are referring to the previous events. Remember the Torah being read to them, their their prayer, and the past two chapters, and, and in chapter 8, Ezra publicly read the law to them, and 9. They continued to listen to this. They started the Feast of Booths. They were, they were committed, they were confessing, and they want to be that outward expression to following, honoring God. And then here the cutting of agreement uh, is the same verb we say in the verse in the prayer when the, they, in, the, in the prayer that they did, and they reminded themselves the prayer that God cut a covenant with Abraham. So this agreement in principle in the micro context of of this scripture in this passage that has taught they were taught from Ezra to understand scripture and this agreement is cut the same way God made to them. So they're they're as serious as God made it. We know God fulfills all his promises. They're wanting to make, you know, that same uh, promise and they want to do it and put it on paper. Why? Because, you know, just like Mr. Moo said, if you put it on paper and tell people and get a bunch of people to sign to it, think of the US Constitution. You know, a bunch of people sat around and planned this. Um, you know, 50, was there is something, 91% of them were, you know, believers in God and some kind of faith, right? So they, they took those principles, they sat down, they wrote it, and they signed it, and they sealed it, right? And it was a, a pass and something we can lean on to and, and point to. And then, much like Dr. Mua mentioned, it, it helps us keep us on the path. Uh, you know, we fall short, we have pride, we have sin. But it's something we can go back to. But later we'll, we're going to point to also how this was a great and beautiful thing. But it also set up to, you know, you heard the Mishnah. Uh, they started looking at tech, uh, scripture in a paradigmatically way. They are putting it in their own context, which, you know, they were trying to put. This, this agreement is kind of like them putting their contemporary view on what the Torah says. And it's okay to do that, but... You got to first look at what scripture says with scripture and then make your interpretation and it's set up to what we know as the, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and a very legalistic society because of that context kind of opened up too far and they attacked the, the loopholes. So why such a public display? I think uh, it sends a message to all the surrounding peoples that they're making this agreement and it will be serving Yahweh. Remember, they've been exiled, and they've heard how bad their fathers were, but they remember this promise. And then just as the Lord publicly identified himself to Israel as his treasured possession, they're wanting to do the same thing here. And then the public nature of binding agreement, it said, once again, it invites that accountability, right? Because there's a bunch of people agreeing to it. The people are present, and they're making this commitment. Verse, verse 1, chapter 10. Now on the sealed document were the following names, Nehemiah the governor, the son of Halkiah, and Zedekiah. The first two names, Nehemiah, we, he needs no introduction. He's the governor of Judah, a Jew serving as a 
Persian governor, and we know from chapter one we've seen his, you know, from his duties as a Persian with the Persian king as the cupbearer all the way through to where he is at now. And now, as a testament not to only his organizational abilities, he's also leading that spiritual leadership in a public or arena. And Zedekiah here, he was an official that was working with Nehemiah and was the scribe who uh, scholars say wrote the actual agreement that I think is still available and can be seen. So scripture here is just like uh, given the, the meat and potatoes, but there was a signed document with all these people and it is still can be visible. Then through the next few verses you see the following names uh, we can we can understand and, and we'll see what their roles were. And in today's term, uh, most people might understand Nehemiah's position to be secular, but he saw it as a divine calling to lead his people back to Yahweh and their, their re-approach. <coughs> the names here in uh, Nehemiah 10 through 2 through 8, I'll, I'll give you a chance and you'll look through them. Uh, and within this list, uh, there are five, 15 ancestral families of the priests who participated in the solemn occasion who were re returnees. Uh, the other names, uh, from what I gather, were had became heads of households, and that was very important in Jewish culture. Only people could sign things who were the heads of households. And just point out, if you notice, Ezra is not on this list, and you're like, he's the high priest that's been preaching all this stuff, but he was from the family of Sarah, and Sarah was the high priest. And if you think back, uh, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed, when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, uh, he was the one that was slain. So Ezra is descendant of that family, but he is not the current head of household of the returnees, so that's why he's not on this list. He has the position, but he's not the um, head of household. And the other names, uh, the head of the Levites were able to sign on the different orders as well. 9 through 13, you see the, here's the rest of the list of the Levites. And the Levites, you know, served as associates to priests. And uh, these are the ones that were head of the order. So that's why they were able to uh, sign. Just uh, if you stick, see any names that stick out. In verses 14 through 27, these were the heads of the people. Long list of names, long list of names. So sorry if you're watching. Uh, if you open your Bible to, to you know, verse 3 all the way to 29, you're going to see this long list of names, and you can, you can go at it and uh, pronounce them. Uh, I know if I mess them up, but that's just a lot of names to say consecutively. Uh, I do apologize. So the first 21 names... On this list are the local leaders, are similar to the list of names that we saw in uh, Nehemiah 7, uh, 8 through 27, along with Nehemiah chapter 3, who participated in the rebuilding of the wall. And you also see this list in Ezra chapter uh, 2. Uh, so uh, 2 through 3 to 20, I believe, is, is the list. But remember, we explained that Ezra and Nehemiah have a little differences, but they're they're very, very minor. The other names are assumed are lay leaders, but what is important, they are just as committed than any other leaders to publicly pledge and, and sign this document and to keep this oath. And now the rest of the people, like Paul Harvey, right? The rest of the story. Verses 28 through 29. So every child, adult, woman who could understood and who separated themselves from surrounding peoples in the order to obey God, uh, God's law, they, they join their leaders and they make an oath to carefully live in God's law. And if you go back to Deuteronomy 29, verses 10 through 13, this is very reminiscent when they were coming back and they were committing God's law and uh, you know putting that oath back to it. The people are following the godly example and they are recommitting to the to the covenant. And their dedication will to God will always be rooted in the knowledge and submission to God's law. And, it, it, and it's beautiful because they like came, they rebuild this wall, 
they they were hearing God's law. I can imagine the witnessing and Nehemiah going around and his leadership and remember the, the back and forth and he had the people coming from all corners and then they finally got it finished and there's still this threat and Nehemiah is being challenged and they've heard the law over and over and they now they're just like so quickly like their, their zeal for God has been invigorated and it comes from it came from good leadership and probably you know teaching the law going to church and, and going to the assemblies and coming together as a community and they're like they saw the commitment that they need to make to God and this verse talks about the separation from themselves and I used to look at this from the wrong angle and over time I think the historical culture did too but the separation here from the nations means from their ungodliness you know i think they really took it the wrong way uh they were to separate themselves from the nations but it was from the ungodliness not the complete annihilation and separation from one nation to another they were supposed to be these witnesses to the other nations but you know they took it as set apart and and a we can't associate with you you're a gentile in verse 30 and that we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. So they promise to submit to God and then their families. The true commitment to the Lord will be reflected in the home, I think. You know, if you set a good example of a head of household and, you, and you're praying, praying uh, dinners at different times, your own discipleship, your own studies, if you're doing all these things in the house, the commitment of the Lord will be reflected in your household. And we have countless scriptures in Exodus, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Kings, about being faithfully remaining separated from the nations and not to marry foreigners. So they're going back to this. And if you're with us in Jeremiah, you, you saw that, right? They were, they were out marrying the other nations and what that did, you know, they took the you know separation to the other spectrum. They were like, oh, let's, Let's go, we'll marry. They intertwine with their pagan cultures and it, and it led to their exile. But I think if they took the separation, that the godliness and being a witness, you know, I think maybe they would have ended up where they were, but it was all part of God's plan anyhow. This is not a, and, and just stay out, you gotta talk about the hard facts and the, and the truth. This is not a racially motivated commitment that they're making uh, many want to say that but it was a spiritual one and where do I get that you think about Rahab and Rahab and Ruth both foreigners uh, who were under God's curse but both received into the community of faith because of their faith and their trust in Yahweh so you can't you can't look at this and be like oh they were it was racially motivated or sexism or anything like that because we have plenty of examples other way who was the first one that Jesus said, I'm the Messiah to? A Gentile woman at the, at the well. So there's plenty of examples that this proves that kind of kind of thinking. And then in the New Testament, we can see Paul warns them, uh, them and us in the second letter, do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership they have righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light and darkness. In 2 Corinthians 6.14. Not that we are not to witness and share the Gospels. We saw that from Rehab and, Rehab and Ruth. Anybody can come to faith, right? Like it's for all nations. It's for anyone who trusts in God and, and sees that. The Samaritan woman was told that Christ was the Messiah, and she believed, right? And we were talking about evangelizing and outreach, right? That is beautiful. And I was reading the book. Did, did she have a lot of knowledge? No, she went out and told, and people started believing. Right? There's, there wasn't a lot of training. There wasn't a seminary. It's not a knock on that. But uh, she went out and she shared what she believed and, and what she heard. And, and people followed and believed. You know, parents, grandparents, family members who are committed to the Lord will teach their children what it means to, to follow Christ. You know, such truth should be communicated by both practice and instruction. You know, that's why we go to church. We go to Bible studies. We we read the Bible and we're an instructional but also a living examples and they wanted to get that construct here. 
Verse 31, and as for the peoples of the land who bring wares or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not receive from them on the Sabbath or, or holy day, and we will forgo the crops the seventh year in the taxation of every debt. So they're going back to the, to the law uh, for foreigners. This is a great thing. Right? They can come and do commerce in Jerusalem. You know, they made it a safe place to trade. They built the wall. And now they have a day where the Jews, every day of the week, they can sell goods to other foreigners without uh, you know, the Jewish sellers and the Jewish uh, commerce going. And this is a good principle to keep, though, the, the Sabbath. And I'm not the Sabbatarian where you can't do anything, but it's supposed to be a focus on the holy day. And their day, there was there was no law that they could not buy or sell from foreigners. You know, so they're they're adding on, right? You can see the building here. You know, nowhere in Deuteronomy it says they can't buy or sell or do anything from foreigners that day, but they're they're adding, they're starting to add to it. And when you add two things that aren't there, you you, you start to create those loopholes. However, the people making the oath are being paradigmatically, uh, right? This is a big, big, huge word, $500 word, right? Uh, it acts as a model or a clear or typical example in applying the law pertaining to the Sabbath in a new context. So they're taking what, you know, was written and what Moses <coughs> instructed, and they're setting this new example and this oath. You know, why? Because maybe it was out of fear because, look, they were, they were returnees from the exiles, and they didn't follow it, so they're adding to it to make it a little bit more stringent to honor and obey God. You know, good, good concept, good principle, but you can see where the loopholes will open up and begin. Verse 32, we also set ourselves under the commandments to give yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. So I can always look up these these monetary values, right? So a, sh a shekel, and it probably doesn't help you because I'm using the metric system too, uh, is 11 grams, which is less than half an ounce, and they were to give one third. So, you know, historically British monarch with the pounds, even the American system at one point, they, you know, the money was based on the weight. You know, they would put it on a scale, and that's how they, they measured the weight. So they gave one third for the service of the house of God. And, you know, I'll let Pastor Buck get more on to the tithing and offers, uh, offering kind of concept, but here the people are demonstrating their commitment to God through their financial means. They recognize that it's important to support and offer uh, to the house, to the temple, to, to make sure everything has everything, but they're, they're setting it as a the commandment to give the, the one third of a shekel. But the idea to support the work of the temple is not explicitly stated in the law. So once again, they're at that big old word, the paradigmatically adding to the context of the law. More of closely related, connected to the law. The law does not specify a tax for the maintenance of the temple, but the law indicates that the people need to give support to the service of the tent meeting from Exodus 30. So, you know, they were commanded to support, but it doesn't say to tithe or or anything like this. So they're adding to it one to keep the temple going and to support that, that uh, temple. And this type of interpretation of scripture is called the Midrash. It's a Jewish interpretive act seeking answers to religious questions, both in a practical and theological way. And I think I have it later, but it, it, it's on my mind now. But, you know, we were wondering, where did the Pharisees start coming from, right? You know, if we read Haggai, you can, you can see it, but it was all about the second temple area, right? So they're, they're rebuilding the wall, they're rebuilding the temple here. Uh, they're very committed to being set apart. And if you look at the word Pharisee, what it means, they're separated from, they're creating this new covenant and new agreement with these loopholes, with the new <clears throat> context, this midrash, the minisha that's, that's coming, where the rabbinic the, the uh, ideology of interpretation and they're 
are coming to. So let's take an example of what the law states, right, uh, about fire. So if you want to contrast the money and giving and offerings to, to fire, so the law states that the fire should be continually burned on the altar from Leviticus chapter 6. But it doesn't specify how the wood for the fire is to su supply, right? Uh, it's much like the offering and the services of the tent. It doesn't say how it's supposed to be offered or the services, but here with the fire. So the people take it upon themselves to set up a system to ensure the priests have the necessary supply of wood to fulfill this law. Uh, the concept we take here, you should give out of your heart, right? That's, that's the offering. They're, they're wanting to help because that's what they're, you know, in their heart they're supposed to do. They're supposed to help the priest. They're commanded to keep that fire. They know the priests and Levites can't do it all. So the people and the communities, they give their time willfully to, to provide that wood to the Levites and the priest. And, you know, the concept as you grow, you know, you can take it with the church as, as, as you offer, as you, as you grow in maturity, you, you help and you help the church. You want to serve the church. You want to give to, to the church in many different ways. And this is what they were doing, but now they're making this commandment to give. I mean, we already talked about it, uh, the weight, the 11 grams, and then the one third is 3.7 grams. So this wasn't a lot, but, you know, maybe back then that was probably definitely a lot of money for the common folk to, to give up. Verse 33, for the showbread, for the continual grain offering, for the continual burnt offering, the Sabbath, the new moon, for the appointed times, for the holy things, and for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. So showbread, I had to look this up. <laughs> I'm like, what, what, is, what is this showbread? I think I've seen it. Uh, a couple of times, but where exactly? So the showbread, uh, from my best uh, cross-reference, you can take it from Leviticus 24, verse 5, uh, where they were commanded to take fine flour and bake 12 cakes from it, right? And I'm not a big fan of the movie Chosen, Chosen, Chosen or the, the TV series, but they did demonstrate the, the baking of this cake, and it kind of put a good picture in it. I wouldn't use that as my theology or coming to Christ through that, but it does explain maybe things in a historical Jewish setting so you have an understanding of what their culture was. But yeah, Peter's mom and his wife were, were, were baking this cake uh, when they went, did like a flashback when he was younger. So there's two tenths of a epace. And you're like, oh my gosh, another word. What is this? So it's a Hebrew dry measure equivalent to a bushel. I, I, I don't, I hope somebody knows what, how much a bushel is, right? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I'm going down this rabbit hole. I'm like, okay, I have a, I, I have the showbread. I have the epoth, and then the, the, the only translation is a bushel. I'm like, oh man, I'm not that good of a, I know, you know, bushels, big, I don't know, you know, I'm just like, I hope people get this, so like, I can't keep going down this rabbit hole, you know, I'm going to be here all day, like, how much is a bushel? <laughs> but, you know, you, you think about it when you get a bushel of uh, fruit, you know, you get you get those things, I'm, I'm just, seems like a lot, but it's only two-tenths of the bushel shall be in eight, each cake, and then what was unique about them, they were to set them uh, in two rows of six, and they were supposed to put this on that pure gold table, right? A very clean, pure table, gold lining, and they were supposed to set this cake on it. It's almost like I was like, man, that's like baking like some cupcakes, putting it on a table and putting caution tape and like having a security alarm. Don't cross and don't touch it. Like it sounds like a beautiful <coughs> display and a lot of hard work into it. And, and they were supposed to put this on this pure gold table before Yahweh in Exodus 25, 24. And also this was the golden altar and golden table Solomon made for the house of Yahweh for the bread of presence. And, and if you have time, you can look in 1 Kings 7, 48. So they're going back. So, you know, at least they're going back and doing some baking, right? They're going to set up this beautiful display and they're gonna bake this bread and they're gonna do it for their love and 
and passion for for Yahweh, and I can I can you know, I can connect to that. They're wanting to do this because of their 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 passion and zeal. So they author and signers of this oath. If you take the rest of that scripture, they're they're going back to the sacrificial offering system. If you want to put that rest of that verse in, into the uh, summary there. Verse 34, Likewise, we cast lots for the supply of the wood among the priests, the Levites, and the people in order to bring it to the house of our God. According to our fathers, our households at fixed times annually to burn on the altar of Yahweh our God as it is written in the law. Uh, we talked about the example of the wall of the wood in verse 12, <clears throat> and they're doing the, the cast lot system. I think Pastor Buck had a good way of doing this, but anytime I look into it and read it, all I can think about is like they're drawing straws, you know, or flipping flipping coins. But but their theory behind it, when they're you know they're casting the lots, that they're 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 trusting God in their decision on who will be appointed. Uh, to do duties as this, right? You know, like, it's not like, oh, I don't want to do it. They're just casting it out and, and doing the lots. Uh, flipping a coin would be a um, you know, game of chance in a secular world, but their casting lots was trusting God to appoint the right person, people to do certain duties. You know, they're just they're, that was their their way of doing it. I just don't know why they just didn't make a list and say, hey. Buck, Ted, you got wood this week. I don't know, <laughs> but they, the the point behind it in principle, you know, not joking, is they're trusting God to pick the right people at the right time. You know, we saw that with you know with the high priest going into the altar, they would cast a lot, and who would go behind the veil to do the the sacrifice and everything. It was an honor. You know, so they were trusting God that the right person was picked at the the right time, and, and this is what they were doing. They were setting up their their duties so that way all the alterings and all the wood it was all available and everybody had a responsibility and commitment to, to support the temple verse 35 and to bring the first fruits of our ground and on the very and the first fruits of all the fruit of every tree to the house of Yahweh annually you know they're they're going back let's bring the finest finest of everything that we have to the house of God and to bring the house of our God the firstborn of our sons and our cattle and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks as written in the law for the priests who are ministering in the house of our God so they're bringing their finest and their first oh symbolic to the coming of Christ right because Christ is the is, is the finest and the unblemished you know they in the law when they're talking about the animals and and the lamb, you know, if you read it, is how unblemished it was supposed to be, you know, certain age. It's just so much connections here, and they're they're going back to that legalistic law that was that was written. Others then seeing the the commitment in the future. Verse thirty seven. We also bring the first of our dough, our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the new wine and oil to the priests at the chambers of the house of our God, and the tithe of our ground to the Levites, and the Levites are they who receive the tithes in all the small towns we serve. You know, so their tithing had a, a principle. It was it was to support the festivals. They were to store them in the storehouse, and they were to tithe to the priests and the Levites, because we know from the Levites they weren't given any land, so they were supposed to be supported by the communities and the other tribes of Israel. Verse 38, and the priests, the son of Aaron, will be with the Levites when the Levites receive the tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. So the verse is speaking of the tithe of tithe that the Levites are going to give as a contribution offering from Yahweh. So they're supposed to receive and tithe from the tithe and, and burn it and alter it to the God and and they were the ones that were supposed to eat their, the remnants of from the burnt offerings and everything else out of, they're supposed to eat, uh, drink, and use the stuff, but they were supposed to store the remainder in the storehouse for, for Passover, for the festival uh, meetings and tent, the booth tents and 
all the festivals that are going on, this is was how it was supposed to support these events. And then the last uh, verse, uh, verse 39, For the sons of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of the grain, the new wine, and the oil to the chambers. The utensils of the sanctuary are there, as well as the priests who are ministering, and the gatekeepers and the singers. Thus we will not forsake the house of our God. And then this verse right here, if you go to Deuteronomy 12, 6, and, and what they were do to do with all the collected fruits for first fruits, firstborn animals, uh, they will bring bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your contributions to the hand, your votive offerings, your free will offerings, and your firstborn of your herd and your flock. They're just committing back to what Deuteronomy has instructed them, what Moses instructed them through God's command. They are committed here. To following and honoring their remember they're cutting an agreement, right? They're trying to they're trying to put this agreement in the same context of you know God making a covenant with Abraham and and Moses, but as you see we're talking some of these things aren't necessarily was in the law from the beginning, so they're starting to add those to those loopholes. But what we can gather here is we can tell the sincerity of the people, right? But we know the future. We have the rest of the of the Bible to go, oh, this is where you started. You know, you started going the other way. They they went far left and started going with the pagans and all this demise, and now they're going to, you know, the far the far right, and it opens it up. And we'll see the, the Pharisees come into play, the Sanhedrin, all these other events to enforce the, the Jewish all but here the people are committed they they recognize and they want to make that same covenant and promise but you know as humans we fall short and we're sinful and we have pride and it, you know the the people and even here in nehemiah where there's a point where i wish nehemiah would just end and it would be a perfect story but oh, okay, okay. i didn't see her over there and then the final verse you know, the people's commitment reveal how they apply to the law. You know, they're, they're very committed. They know that the people before them, their fathers, they, they failed. So rather than being locked into a legalistic word for word reading for the law, uh, which lends itself to loopholes, they understand and they use this paradigmatically. They're trying to put it in a modern context, but it does open up to further interpretation. And then a couple of questions that to chew on, to think on, to ponder, to, to you know, meditate over later. How should one's commitment to Christ affect one's way of life in the home? You know, at the beginning of the slide, you had a couple of examples of exercising and reading the Bible at the same time. Well, even into that, right? <laughs> Probably can't run or walk very fast, but I applaud those efforts from that video or from that picture. And you saw the baptism part of being Baptist or a believer, the believer of baptism or making that commitment. We saw study groups and prayers. You know, we, we can invite friends over and, and study together and share the gospel or we have technology today that you know we can share with others a lot easier uh, than in the past. But how should one's commitment to Christ affect one's life at home? It should be a Christ centered home. Considering the way people go about making their song of the God in Nehemiah 10, what can we learn about how we should go about making commitment to the Lord? In the beginning, there was Robert Mua. He was a secular psychologist, but he was out of it. And there was some good stuff that you could take from that. You know, if we, if you write down a plan, you make steps, and you don't try to be too big. You might have a big goal at the end, but you break it down it makes it more achievable but if I just kept it at home in my office down in the basement and I never shared it with it then I don't have that accountability Pastor Buck was really good he was writing his dissertation he'd be like oh I need help I need prayer you know, he was seeking that accountability many people encouraged him in the church to write and that's why he was successful he had that big goal but being open about it and setting a plan that made him be able to finish that you know, we're able to finish things to, reading the Bible through the year, we have a plan. If we just try to do that on our own and we didn't have a group, you know, we may fall short or 
our life will catch up, but that plan and being together in commitment keeps us committed. So we can see good things from this agreement, but we also saw where it kind of put them in the trajectory as well. And then in closing, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior today, you know, today is the day. There's a lot of things going on in the world, and you don't know your last day. You don't know your last moments so it's not my words it's the verses are you committed like they are to to follow and honor god it might have been a sacrificial offering system and a lot of legalistic type of things to do but they these people were committed right there are we committed you know repent trust and believe in faith in, in god and him and christ alone in jesus name we pray amen